Tonight, our theme is on the Ninth Amendment. Our keynote speaker says and asserts that the Ninth Amendment's unenumerated rights provision is far from being an ink blot, as Justice Scalia has referred to it. He argues that the unenumerated rights of the Ninth Amendment can be readily identified by examining the amendments proposed by the state ratifying conventions and extracting the rights implicit in these proposals, some of which are found themselves in the first eight amendments, the rest of which were included by reference in the Ninth. He's the founder of the Constitution Society, a graduate of the University of Chicago, where he earned his degree in math and satisfied all course requirements for a degree in philosophy and all but one in physics. His early education has much in common with the way most America's founding fathers began theirs, through self-study. He's an ardent supporter of the Framers Constitutional Republic. His wake-up call came during his senior year in high school, having bumped into a passage from his American government textbook stating that the founders would have considered most modern legislation based on the Commerce Clause to be unconstitutional. From that day, he began his inquiry and his quest, and thus brings us an address tonight, the presumption of non-authority and unenumerated rights, the true sovereigns contained in the Ninth Amendment. Please welcome John Rowland as he comes and addresses us tonight. This is the nature of a mic check. How do you hear? Now we'll see if the... Seems to be responding. Okay, give it a minute to warm up. The talk title is matched on our website, constitution.org, with a law review article with the same title. It is a work in progress, so it is not yet ready to be cited or copied or widely distributed, but you can see how it develops uh, by coming to our website, constitution.org, and uh, waiting for its publication in some law review journal, probably. I began examining the Ninth Amendment for the reason that many people do. The F Madison and the others referred to unenumerated rights, but what are these? Justice Scalia says he can't find them. He's looking for rights to be stated explicitly in some constitutional provision, but that totally defies the concept of the Ninth Amendment. So what is it that we mean when we talk about unenumerated rights? Well, I investigated this. I studied the history of the development, drafting of the Constitution, the ratification conventions, the amendments that they proposed, and it was very clear that the process that resulted in the Bill of Rights was one in which primarily Madison, to, uh, then followed by committees and uh, of this House of Representatives and the Senate, who extracted from the many proposed amendments those that there were thought to be most important, and those became the first eight amendments. Because they wanted to keep the list of amendments short, they bundled all of the rest into the last two amendments, the ninth and the tenth, presuming that these would not be controversial, that they would be well understood, and therefore did not have to be made explicit. In the light of the way things have worked out, we might have wished that he had been more explicit. What I try to do as a historian and philosopher of law is to examine the historical record to find out just what it is that he meant and they meant, and to some extent clarify the language that they themselves struggled to use 
to under describe the concepts that they had. Because language has evolved in 200 years, not always for the better, but sometimes it has improved, but it is different. I advise everyone to approach the study of the Constitution as though they were the study of a foreign language. As I was pointed out earlier by an earlier, another speaker, the Constitution is not written in ordinary lay English, either of 1787 or certainly not today. Many of the key terms are terms of art from law, and in that day and time, lawyers, and for that matter, laymen, did not use dictionaries. The idea of the dictionary was still very new. Dr. Samuel Johnson only introduced the first major one in 1776. In those days, a lawyer was not expected to use a dictionary type definition for the terms he used. He was expected to study the law, legal history, legal cases, the treatises of the legal writers, and extract the meaning of things, of words, from the context in which they were used. This required a huge amount of study. By 1787, it was difficult for anyone in England or the United States to call himself a truly competent lawyer unless he had spent at least 10 or 15 years just reading old cases. And that was especially difficult in the colonies because they didn't have all the law books that were available in England. So, in some ways, by 1787, law had begun to deviate from how it was practiced and understood in England. And you hear references to common law. There were actually two divergent branches of common law in 1787 one in England and one in the United States. And I'll get into later how a little bit of a description of how they differed. In order to understand oh, hit the wrong button. There we go. In order to understand the unenumerated rights, though, we first have to examine rights in general, the concept. Madison and a few of the others began to try to explain this to some degree. The way they did it is a little bit vague, but what they were reaching for was the notion that delegated powers and exercises of rights complement one another. The field of public action is what we say partitioned into those two categories. So each delegation of a power restricts rights, each declaration of a right restricts delegated powers. Now this use of the term right is a somewhat imprecise and Later, by the time of the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the usage had begun to sharpen and to be used the term immunity, a right against an action of government, as distinct from, say, contractual rights. So a, what we're really talking about is immunity, is which may be expressed as a restriction on a power and a power as a restriction on a right. And in what became the Bill of Rights, we can see how some of the rights are expressed as restrictions on the power of Congress. Congress shall make no law. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and so forth. And also as declarations of rights in a more positive language. There we go. Now, some patriots 
simplify and try to say that all rights come from God, it's not quite that simple. There are actually four main sources of rights. And I find it is most convenient to discuss these as though there were four constitutions. First, there's a constitution of nature. This is the subject matter of the, the sciences. Mathematics, physics, chemistry. The sciences are concerned with the laws of nature. No constitution of society, state, or government can be considered constitutional if it violates the law of nature. Well, that's expressed in one ancient maxim of law, that the law may not command the impossible. You can't, law can't command you to be in two places at once. That would be a violation of the, what I call the constitution of nature. Society arises from the social compact, discussed by philosophers like James Locke. I'm, I mean, sorry, John, John Locke. The concept is that you start in a state of nature before there's a society. The society is formed by agreement to live together in peace and to protect one another's rights. Now, the way that most societies, the way that most people enter society is not by a bunch of adults sitting around and reaching an agreement. They are inducted into an existing society by their parents. What a parent does when he brings up a child is makes him, tries to bring him up as a good citizen. In effect, is the deal is that he starts out by you being, a good, you being a good child, I'll be a good parent, and oh, by the way, I expect you to respect and defend the rights of the people with whom I am in a state of society with. So by extension, the child then becomes a member of society and is obligated to defend the rights of everyone in it. Now there's a name in the Constitution for the duty of the society, of those who enter in society, it's called militia. Militia is just a way of saying a duty to defend one another. The state is the third level. A people can be united in a society and yet have no territory. They could be a bunch of nomads wandering across the landscape as the Native Americans were in that time. Uh, it is only when you acquire effective dominion over a piece of territory that you can be said to constitute a state. And there are certain rights that arise from that state of affairs. Finally, there is a constitution of government. The, doc, the written document adopted in 1789 represents such a constitution. Each must be compatible with the one in which it is nested. If a written constitution of government is incompatible with the natural constitutions of state, society, and nature, then it is defective. We can say that it fails to meet the proper design standards for a constitution of government. And if you go to my website, constitution.org, you can find links or copies to almost every constitution of every nation on earth, including some of their old ones, and of course the states. And if you begin to review these constitutions with this con framework in mind, you'll find that some of these constitutions are not really constitutional. One of the most common defects being that they call on, they make it a constitutional right to provide the sufficient quantity of some resource that may not always be in sufficient quantity. And that's a violation of the constitution of nature. Law cannot command the impossible. And it may not always be possible to do that. 
And if you look at the way that our const written constitution was written, nowhere in it does it command the expenditure of a sufficient amount of some resource. Resources are always considered to be scarce. There we go. Now, we can break them down. Some of these should be familiar to you. Life, limb, and liberty come from the state of nature. Now you notice that limb is not always mentioned, but it needs to be for a complete picture of the, of the, of the or complete listing. And at the level of nature, you don't yet have complete property rights as they are generally understood in law. In nature, you have the right to acquire, possess, and use the means to secure the other above immunities or rights. Uh, the immunities deriving from the constitution of society are things like due process, fair hearing and decision, common law trusts, denizenship, and public decision by public convention. Now this last is interesting because that's the way the constitutions of government are themselves ratified. The default mode of government of, of a society, whether it's a state or, or stateless, is that you call a public convention by public notice that specifies the purpose of the convention, specifies the date and place and so forth. It is open to all of the cons constituted members of that society and is conducted according to established rules of procedure. That is an unwritten kind of constitution, and yet it's the foundation for the constitution of government. Now within due process, that includes things like a jury. The concept of jury is, arises from the constitution of society rather than of nature properly. And common law trust, well, the constitution is a kind of trust. Again, it arises out of the constitution of society. The privileges, the denizenship arises from the constitution of the state. It is, pertains to a right to remain at a location of one's birth and uh, residency and to return to it if one leaves. That indicates an indi a notion of territory, a place. And it introduces a another layer of property rights, property as title and recovery following loss of possession. In the state of society, people recognize that you don't have to remain in possession of a piece of property. You can loan it to somebody you can leave it for a period of time and come back to it, it's still yours. And finally, the constitution of government brings in the main topic of this talk, the presumption of non-authority and the associated prerogative writs. It means the ability to remove misbehaving officials or suspend their actions such as quo warranto. We'll get into more detail on what quaranto is. It includes things like access to voting and accurate counting of votes, holding office, getting reports of the activities and expenditures of officials, and compensation for the taking of property. All of these rights or immunities only make sense after you have a government. Oops.
Madison made the distinction between natural and social rights in this statement when he introduced the Bill of Rights in the House of Representatives. He pointed out that trial by jury cannot be considered as a natural right, but a right resulting from a social compact. He made a few other statements like that, and so did the others. They were not philosophers of law who spent a lot of time systematizing the subject. So a philosopher of law today needs to go back and extract their concepts and put them in more precise language in order to have an understanding of what they really meant. Now this diagram illustrates the distinction between public and private action. All human action is the outer ellipse. Public action is the red one. Private action, the outer gray one. Actually, these are different colors on the, my screen, but they come out differently with a projector. Okay? Some actions are delegatable and some are not. To either under society, the constitution of society, or the constitution of nature, or the constitution of the state. Then you can have private delegations to, for private business, private affairs, hiring an agent to represent you, uh, uh, a, par a property manager for your property, and so forth, employees generally. Then there are the subsets of those that are actually delegated. And where it gets a little bit complicated, and the reason for this diagram is that we delegate some powers to the state and some to the union. They overlap to some degree, but you can't necessarily call a, something a right against the federal government and say that it's also a right against the state government because you can also delegate some other powers to the state government. So what you have left over are rights against both levels of government. Now this, again, shows the concept in a slightly different form. And again, it emphasizes that uh, you can have different powers actually delegated to each level. Now this brings us into the question of what are fundamental immunities versus merely civil immunities. The Supreme Court and other courts have been struggling with this ever since the 14th Amendment because they're faced with having to decide, they can't just say that anything that's not a delegated power delegated to the federal government is a right against the state as well as the federal government. So you have to have a way of distinguishing and you do it by figuring out what is delegatable to the state, what is delegatable to the union, what is actually delegated to each, and what is left over when those delegations are taken into account. And again, the concept illustrated with this slightly different colors. Now, we get into the Ninth Amendment. We have first Madison's original formulation, his words, about what became the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. This is the form in which he proposed it uh, together with that quote I gave earlier of his introduction of the Bill of Rights. But this provides some notion of what he had in mind when he did it. And then, of course, we have the final wording of the Ninth Amendment. Now, each of the states in their ratifying conventions proposed various 
rights. Now, they were proposing, of course, amendments. Not all the amendments pertain to rights or were expressed in those terms. So part of what one has to do to understand the Ninth Amendment is to extract the rights components from these proposed amendments. Now, many of the states uh, proposed exact copies of one another's proposals. So we know, we know what they took seriously, and it is important to recognize that these rights were not considered controversial. They were taken for granted. There was no dispute that anyone has found as to whether these really are rights. But it's also clear that many of them did not make it into the first Eighth Amendments as explicit statements. What I find particularly interesting, and we should find particularly interesting, is of the New York proposed amendments, which contain an item calling for the right to writs in the name of the people. Now, what does that mean? Well, writs, the prerogative writs, quo warranto, habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibito, procedendo, certiorari are the six most important ones, were taken for granted. Now, granted, they were first created by statute to be used by the English monarch. But they expressed underlying principles, like Magna Carta did, that became the rights of the people when they separated from England and the sovereign became the people. So these writs arise, now, you, now obviously you can't have writs if you don't have courts, and you can't have courts unless you have a government, but the underlying principles arise from the constitution of society. They precede government. And in the name of the people was a key term of art. What it meant was that any individual has what we today call standing to privately prosecute a public right. Only habeas corpus preserves that today. Anyone can go to court file a writ of habeas corpus to get anyone else out. You don't have to be the one detained. You don't have to be a relative. You don't have to be his, his attorney. Anyone can do that. But this also applied to any of the other writs, sometimes called common law writs. They're called prerogative writs because they were supposed to be considered ahead of all other actions in the common law courts of England. If you got a writ of habeas, if judge got a writ of habeas corpus, he was supposed to set aside the rest of the docket and deal with that first. And they differ from ordinary civil or criminal proceedings because the burden of proof is not on the petitioner, it's on the respondent. It is not like a motion to show cause, which is the way judges try to treat it today. And the order of the court is not the writ. The petition itself, when filed with the court and served on the respondent, is the writ. And the way it's supposed to work, the official has between three and 20 days, depending on how far he is from the court, to prove his authority. Habeas corpus is a kind of subset of quo, quo warranto. Quo, quo warranto is for any official action. Habeas corpus is for detaining someone. And the way it's supposed to work is that the, the right belongs not to the petitioner, but to the respondent to prove his authority. But if he can't prove his authority, or if the court doesn't hold a hearing, it is supposed to default to the position of the petitioner and against the respondent. 
Just like in a civil action, if somebody files suit against you and you don't respond to it, the, the plaintiff can take a default judgment. Very similar principle, except in this case, the default judgment goes against the, defend, the respondent, even if there's no hearing. Now, what all of that depended on, it was militia enforcing this order, order of things. The people themselves had to be prepared to say, okay, this guy has filed a writ of habeas corpus, and the judge hasn't even bothered to hold a hearing. Well, the writ issues, we're going to go down to the jail and get the guy out. And the sheriff had better not get in our way. Same way with any office. If someone has not been properly elected or appointed to office, if he can't prove his authority to hold that office, he has to get out. Turn over the keys, you know, vac clean out the desk, leave. Or if he's some kind of action, collecting an unlawful tax, for example, or uh, taking somebody's property, doing almost anything else, if he doesn't have authority to do it, under this legal framework, you're supposed to be able to go in, challenge his authority. If he can't prove he has the authority, he has to stop. Now, the right to a remedy has been spelled out, but it's often there's often some confusion about what that really means. When a petitioner seeks a remedy, for example, asks the government to answer, prove his authority, the remedy is not to order the official to prove his authority, is to provide some other relief that de results if he doesn't, such as removal from office or the, what we would today call an injunction, was then called a writ of prohibito. In other words, he's got to stop doing what he's doing. And it would be t common for a writ of quo ronto to be accompanied by a writ of prohibito, to be signed by the judge if the proof was not forthcoming. What's interesting, the seventh item here, is that some of the states propose that natural rights <coughs> be recognized in the Constitution as rights explicitly. Now, of course, it didn't spell out what those were. Everyone understood what they were. But in order to understand what they were, you had to refer back to the political philosophers, especially Locke, uh, Lord Edward, Ed, Edward Cook, uh, Cook uh, and others who spell it out in their writings. Now, here are a few others. Some of these are the first one, challenging the jury, is actually incorporated into current practice, but it wasn't spelled out in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. <coughs> but it was essentially a clarification of the notion of due process where jury was a concern. No tiles of nobility, no ex post facto laws. And the, lat the 11th and 12th are interesting because so far we've been talking about the presumption of non authority. This introduces a second category of rights. Uh, providing the means to supervise our officials. They can be ordered to disclose what they did and how much money they spent or how much money they took in. Uh, this did find its way, part of this did find its way into the Constitution, but not all of it are not as clearly as we'd like. They felt that it wasn't clear enough. Now we see part of it, the, pub, the 
publishing of journals to be represented in the current Freedom of Information Act at the federal level, and there are state acts that are similar to that. Open Records Act, there's, there's a common name for them. In other words, there are statutory uh, foundations for requiring public officials, for example, hold meetings in public, sunshine laws, not to meet in private, to keep a record of their proceedings, to disclose that to the public, to keep a record of how they handle money and so forth. And it's a major area of contention. But these were considered rights in those days. Now, what I've listed here are some of the findings concerning my investigation of what these unenumerated rights are. The prerogative writs are not limited to habeas corpus. You'll notice too that nowhere in the Constitution does it say we have a right to habeas corpus. It just says the right to habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in times of emergency. That presumes that we have it. <clears throat> but nowhere does it actually say we have it. And what they were, some of the states were proposing is that we make it explicit, that people have a right. But they wanted to add the other prerogative rights as well. <coughs> now, what happened to prosecution of a public right by a private individual? Well, the main thing that happened to it was a Supreme Court case called Frothingham v. Mellon in 1923. Up until that time, it was presumed that any individual could go to court, and if there was an unconstitutional statute that some official was trying to enforce, he could go to court and challenge it, get it declared unconstitutional. Now, what the Supreme Court did is they built upon the notion of standing for seeking money damages and restricted standing, which was a new word at the time. The word was not used until Frothingham, to those who had actually suffered personal injury. Now, of course, that made sense for money damages. If you hadn't suffered personal injury, you, you know, what kind of damages could you ask for? <clears throat> but it, what it did not make sense for is declarative and injunctive relief, where you're trying to defend other people against injury, even though you don't expect to be injured yourself. And the right of the presumption of non-authority does not depend on the support of a court. A lot of people have the notion that you have to have a court for everything. We become a very litigious society, a very court-centered society, but we need to keep in mind that a court is only a service to provide a recourse to civil conflict. Just because a court is not there doesn't mean you don't have a right, or that, it is the, that the only way you can enforce a right is to go to court and get a judge to back your position. The court may choose not to hear your case at all, that doesn't mean you don't have a right, but you may have to enforce it yourself. Among lawyers, this is called self-help. Okay? I, I, I love that term because it says so little and so much. What it really means is that if there is no court, you can get together with a few of your supporting neighbors and go over and enforce your rights against some offender who may be supported by his friends and neighbors, and before you know it, you have a real bloodbath. And most of society doesn't want people going at each other that way. So they say, wait a minute, guys, hold off here. Let's appoint a neutral arbiter. We'll call him a judge, and it may be a jury. We'll investigate the facts and decide which one of you are right. Then we're going to take the side of one or the other of you. But until we do that, hold off, you know, keep your guns holstered, uh, 
let's f solve this in a nonviolent way. So that's what courts are for. They serve one purpose, to avoid civil conflict, and they do have no real power to enforce their decisions that we don't give them by consenting and respecting the court's order. And all of that is a matter of custom. As custom, it arises from the constitution of society. The court can't make anybody do anything. We give it power, each and every one of us, by respecting its orders and carrying them out. And if we don't, it's just a scrap of paper. So, another one of the common law rights included the right of demur. That's almost disappeared from law today, but uh, it was very important from the famer's point of view and is worth investigating for on its own merits. Now further, The natural rights are those that arise from the state of nature, getting back to that. Rights, official acts, have to be logical, reasonable, and rational. You may not be required to do the impossible. Now, one of the things this means is that the official acts and the law in general have to be logical. A famous judge one said in a, for, judge said in a famous trial once, after ruling, overruling his own correctly decided motion, uh, the law doesn't have to be logical. Yes, it does. There are many logical conflicts in the law, and lawyers themselves are usually logically challenged. I took uh, the LSAT test qualifying test for law school a number of years ago, and one of the things I noticed about it, there was, had several sections on legal reasoning, and uh, I noticed that some of the questions had more than one correct answer, and some had no correct answer. So I wrote, a, I, I wrote about this problem to the authors of the LSAT, the company that puts them out, and it says, well, you know, we're not testing formal logic, we're, te we're testing uh, informal reasoning. Okay, uh, well, don't you think it might be a good idea to test formal reasoning? You know, the logic that w mathematicians understand and respect. And it says, well, you know, we're, we're not really into being logically consistent, we just want to be persuasive. And then I say, well, do you realize that in a system of propositions that allows even one contradiction, it allows all contradictions? And no statement is not also both true and false at the same time in such a system. <laughs> Which really means that you don't have a system for deciding the validity of propositions. All you have left is a system that a judge or whoever can pick among and say, this, I like this one better. So this is one of the reasons why so many critics of our legal system come from the hard sciences. I'm from, my professional field is mathematics. I've made my living as a computer programmer. I have actually written computer programs to verify and and find proofs to theorems. I don't just do it as an art, I pro program machines to do it. And guess what? If you try to apply that kind of analysis to the practices of the IRS, <laughs> there is no unbroken logical chain of authority leading from the provisions of the Constitution to the practices of the IRS. It is broken at every step along the way. Now, if I tried to present this kind of analysis to a judge, he would just glaze over, assuming he was honest enough to look at it in the first place. 
But yeah, it is actually possible uh, to do what mathematicians and logicians do, to apply the methods of the formal uh, calculus, as we call it. It's not strictly speaking first order predicate calculus, it's a higher order, but uh, the kind of logic that you can put in a machine and have it verify it. Now, it is a matter of common right to engage in any occupation not subject to licensure or taxation. Okay? Delegations of power are never plenary. Uh, Judge, Justice Marshall's opinion, which is really only a dictum, in Gibbons v. Ogden is that the power delegated to Congress is plenary within its sphere, was a term he used. Wrong. Almost all of the powers delegated to Congress are further constrained by being reasonable for a legitimate public purpose. I like to cite the example of uh, the preemptive power of Congress to regulate the time, place, and manner of congressional elections, except for the place of senatorial elections. Does that mean that Congress had its, within its power the power to require that people uh, cast their ballots at polling places on the moon? Or with a one nanosecond time frame? Or choosing candidates only from a ballot that was pre-approved by the party? Of course not. They have to exercise their power in ways that are further constrained by legitimate purposes and done in a reasonable way. There are no plenary powers delegated. There's a right not to be subjected to laws or official acts that are unknown, unknowable, or incomprehensible. Okay? So, obviously, if we have a situation where even the lawyers don't know what the law is, and certainly the judges don't until they get a case before them, maybe not then. Uh, how in the world are, is the jury or the poor citizen expected to obey laws like that? At some point, the old dictum of the ignorance of the law being no excuse fails. When the country was founded, the body of law could mostly be summarized in Blackstone's commentaries, four volumes. That was most of what a lawyer needed to know. Of course, there was really more than that when you got into constitutional issues, but still, it was nothing like the shelves and shelves and shelves of statutes and regulations that we have today. Well beyond the capability of anyone to know everything that applies to him or how to comply with it. So that is a fundamental problem in itself. That is a violation, really, of the constitution of nature. Because you're imposing a computational problem for limited human minds that is beyond their capability. And there must always be an effective remedy to any infringement of a right. Now, as I've said in, er, in, an, in another talk, <clears throat> what has really occurred in the last 200 years is not the loss of our rights. And for every right there is a remedy. Ubi jus, ibi remedium. We haven't lost the remedies either, but what we have lost is easy access to the remedies. The system has progressively put the remedies further and further out of reach. First, by making them too expensive, having to hire lawyers in order to uh, uh, get the remedies. Uh, having to file expensive, do expensive research and file long, voluminous pleadings, uh, or of course simply the problem of <clears throat> knowing the judge so that you're going to get a favorable decision because 
the, the opposing side knows the judge better. So remedies and access to remedies be, then becomes the real issue. There is a right not to prosecute, not, not to be subject to laws one does not have the right with the consent of a grand jury to prosecute or help prosecute. Now this one is not easy to extract from the legal literature, but it's implicit in it. It was assumed that anyone could go to a grand jury in a criminal case, file a complaint and have the grand jury issue the indictment to him, not to a public prosecutor, to him, to prosecute in court. And in fact, this order of things still exists in some countries, it's still on the books, even in this country, but it is systematically suppressed. First of all, the, pro the public prosecutors who didn't used to exist until uh, the last few decades of the 19th century, won't let you take your complaint to the grand jury. And if you do, they'll say, no, no, you can't issue it to this private citizen. You've got to issue the indictment to me, the prosecutor. Well, of course, I may choose not to do anything with it. Well, especially if it's the indictment is against me <laughs> or the judge. So for cases of public corruption, where there is too often collusion between the judge and the prosecution, you don't have an effective remedy available to you to deal with that corruption. And so one of the frontiers for restoring our constitutional order is to revive private criminal prosecutions. There's a right to do one's duty and a duty to defend the rights of others. This was discussed earlier by Ed Vieira. <clears throat> Militia, properly understood, is not a body of men, it's an activity. The, original, the term originally meant from the Latin um, military activity or military service, but of course the Romans used their militia for things like crime control and disaster response and many other things. So military tends to be more specialized today. It, normally you don't send the military out to enforce the laws against criminals, posse comitatus and all that. Um, so it makes more sense when we're trying to restate the language in terms that are more precise to speak of militia as defense activity. And if you substitute the words defense activity for militia, wherever they occur in the Constitution or wherever, you'll find the light dawns on you. Because the substitution works and the concept becomes suddenly much more clear. It was the idiom in that time, and in fact the idiom persists to this day, of using the same word for both an activity and for those engaged in it. It's, you could call it an economy of language, but in an era before di dictionary definitions, it was natural to use words in that way and to be understood from context. And to even use the same word with multiple meanings at the same time to convey the idea both of the activity and those engaged in it. Today, people try to use a word like militia to mean only those engaged in it. But then if you lose sight of the concept that a single individual defending himself or others is engaged in militia. When you defend yourself against a criminal, you are issuing a militia call-up, which anyone may do, who is aware of a threat. You're the only one who responds. And in defending yourself, you are doing two things. You are defending the community against a threat, who just happens to be, you just happen to be the only member of the community at that, on that occasion, and you're enforcing the law. 
So when you, if you are pr properly pleading uh, uh, self-defense as a defense in court, what you really should be doing to be consistent with this understanding of the Constitution would be to say, no, Your Honor, it's not quite true that I was engaged in self-defense. I was engaged in militia. I was enforcing the law. What I was trying to do is arrest the guy. Yeah, okay, he resisted. <laughs> All right. But, you know, I, he had his chance. I was perfectly willing to make a custodial arrest and deliver him to the nearest magistrate of, magistrate of competent jurisdiction for arraignment. But he wouldn't have it. You know, I couldn't safely you know, just walk away. He might hurt me or he might hurt somebody else, so I had to take him in, and he resisted. So, well, too bad about that. Now, the jury is supposed to review the decisions of the judge, the bench, on all points of law in reaching a general verdict of guilty or not guilty in a criminal case. This is represented by a case called Statinius, which you'll find on our website from 1839, fairly you know, <coughs> written by Judge Cranch, who was uh, not exactly one of the founders, but the next generation, but a leading legal scholar of his age, in which he pointed out that the parties and their lawyers have the right to argue all issues of law to, directly to the jury until the judge has made his ruling. and to have the judge defer his ruling on a point of law until all arguments are completed. That means he could not, the judge could not lawfully, constitutionally, require the parties to submit their legal arguments in briefs to him in chambers for him to consider out of the hearing of the jury. Had had to be delivered to the jury themselves, because they could not bring a verdict of guilty or not guilty unless they had a chance to review the legal issues, because that's part of the total con uh, uh, scheme under which anyone be can be convicted of a crime. And Statinius opinion, the opinion in Statinius is very clear on this. It's being systematically violated, has been for more than a century, in almost every criminal court in the country, which means that every one of those criminal convictions are void. And I bring this up from time to time with my law professor friends, I, which, which I am in regular debates with, and they all agree, in fact, most of them anyway, that I am right as a matter of history and original understanding, but we don't do it that way anymore, and you're never going to get a judge to go along with it. So that's where we stand at the, on that point. There is a right not to have officials take actions under color of delegated authority that are only convenient or may tend to the outcome de desired by the delegation of power. In other words, the power to uh, regulate commerce is not the power, together with the necessary and proper clause, to do anything that's necessary to get a regulated outcome. A delegated power is only a power to make a certain kind of effort, and if the effort doesn't work, you're stuck. Okay, you can't assume more and more and more power in order to get the desired outcome. You can only make a certain effort. There's a right to have delegated powers construed narrowly and complementary rights or immunities construed broadly. Remember, they are complementary to each other. So if powers are construed narrowly, 
then that means rights are construed broadly. And if there is any doubt between an, in an issue between a government official and a private citizen, whether or not the citizen has a right, the presumption should always be in favor of the right. There we go. Okay. Here are some presumptions of non-authority <clears throat> that we do find remnants of in the law. The presumption of innocence being the, probably the most familiar. Unfortunately, we also have some on the contrary, presumptions of authority. Courts declaring that legislation passed by Congress shall be deemed are presumed to be constitutional, unless it can be shown otherwise. That's not the way it's supposed to work. The burden of proof has to be on the executive official trying to enforce a law that the statute passed by Congress was constitutional, not the other way around. Similarly, courts are not supposed to defer to the findings of administrative officials. Okay, there's an ancient tradition of courts appointing special trustees or administrators or whatever, investigating a situation, reporting back to the court. However, that evidence is supposed to not be considered valid by default. It has to be proven like any other. Here are some legal maxims that express this, and they go back a long way, but essentially it says power is strictly interpreted. In cases of doubt, the presumption is not in favor of a power. A delegated power cannot be delegated, and there is no right without a remedy. Those need to be kept in mind. Now, if there's time, I open the floor to questions. If not, I'll turn it over to the MC. Yes, sir. We'll only have time for a couple of questions, but go ahead, sir, right here. Does a regular judge, being a superior court judge, ever have the authority to say, this is unconstitutional, I'm throwing it out? Yeah, yes. Any, anyone may do constitutional review. In fact, it's a duty, not just a judge. It's only called judicial review when a judge does it. But every single one of us in our lives has to be able to resolve conflicts of law that may arise in any situation in which we encounter. And where one of the laws in conflict is the Constitution, to decide in favor of the Constitution. Good. Do we have another one, real quickly? Couple. Yes, sir, go ahead. I would like to have Mr. Owens uh, to say, comments on New Hampshire's Article 10 of our Bill of Rights. And one, do we implement it. Restate it, please. It's the only one in the entire country that has the right of revolution. Mm -hmm. And of course, <clears throat> unfortunately, if you try to exercise that right, you'll be considered a terrorist these days. Because, of course, the powers that be just can't imagine that they could be tyrants. So we do have a disconnect, a, a, a different perceptions, let us say, let's call it a failure of communication. Um, and part of the problem is that we have to educate them so that at least they have doubts about the rightness of their own position. Because, you know, the reality is that if most people in public life really do believe they're the good guys. Uh, they might have sneaking doubts about it, but <laughs> Human beings have a remarkable ability to rationalize their behavior. And so they'll convince themselves, you know, Darth Vader was just absolutely certain that he was doing the, the best thing for the peace and tranquility of the galaxy. 
Other people didn't see it that way. <laughs> so sometimes <clears throat> you're just not going to get agreement and it's going to have to come to arms. Let's, let's give uh, <clears throat>